Welcome to the Lobby GameSpot's weekly video game chat show every Tuesday at 2pm Pacific right here on videogames.com, the home of video games. It's true. <laughs> the only stuff. place to read about video games on the internet. That's Can true. you believe it? It's the, we're the last one. Yeah. The rest <laughs> of them <laughs> left. Won't. Yeah. I mean, some of them have been writing up articles about how to pet animals in Far Cry. That's, that's right. the... That's listen, <laughs> listen. So <laughs> let's get right into it. <laughs> Petting animals. Yeah. yeah, it's great though. Primal, like I've played a yeah. few hours. It's really fun. It's cool. It's a cool game. Scott Butterworth. Yes. Hello. Yes. Good to have you here. It's me. Thank you. Happy to be here. Uh, you've reviewed a bunch of video games for GameSpot. Yeah, I did like three in a row. Like last time I was on the show, I talked <laughs> about Firewatch and then I immediately reviewed the Dying Light DLC the following yes. and then I just finished reviewing uh, Plants vs. Zombies Garden Warfare 2, which yeah. is out today actually. Perfect. So. Uh, Dying Light had been out for a little while, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That came out uh, a week ago. Oh. Yeah, I believe a week ago today it was cool. out. So we're going to talk about uh, two of those in just a minute. Uh, we're also going to talk with Mike Mahardy about Far Cry Primal in a little bit too. And uh, Peter Brown, you're here too. Hi. Hi, Peter. I'm just here to fulfill the the beard requirement. Right. Yes, yeah. that's a good. Which is saying, yeah. I, in fact, I was wearing glasses for the first time in about ten years yesterday, so I'm glad I didn't wear them today. Because yeah, it would have been too mad. It just would have been the three of no, us. No, yeah. I was hoping you were going to wear them. Oh, really? Yeah. I was hoping this was going to be like a new era of spectacles. See, I, you had a beard that would be perfect because then we'd have like glasses and beard. Oh, yeah. Just beard, just glasses. It's like the nightmare last round of a game of Guess Who. Exactly. Yeah. Someone exactly. could create this horrific image of our beards intertwined for the promo. <laughs> Do you guys call that Guess Who here? Yes. It's called Guess. It's called Guess it's Who? It's called Guess Who. Because there's so many little ones that are like, Where's Waldo? is called Where's Wally? Yeah. In Europe. <laughs> and like, <laughs> why is that Elevators weird? or lifts. And yeah. Waldo is a respectable name. Waldo? Waldo. Compared really? to Wally? Yeah, okay, compared to Wally. Cluedo, Cluedo. You got you guys saw the clue, right? I actually yes, we have clue. Yeah, like Colonel you, Mustard with the candlestick. Yeah, you call and the, it Cluedo. Cluedo, yeah. What? Cluedo. Clue makes sense because you look for clues when you're. What does Cluedo mean? <laughs> is it's it like, not a real word. Is it like clue comma though? Like no, the shorthand. One though? word. <laughs> Made up word. Cluedo. I mean, come on, boggle. Like car. Surety, Boggles the mind, surety, doesn't surety, it, Danny? <laughs> surely oh. board games is like the one area in which we can... I don't, okay, actually, the one that did really bother me recently was I was cereal shopping. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and it wasn't Lucky Charms this time. Go on! <laughs> uh, Frosted Flakes. Yeah, We call them Frosties. It's way better. That seems like to be like that, that English like shorthand for thing where you yeah. just like add that, that little like emphasis. Frosties! Yeah. Hey, Frosties. Frosties, go. Oh, you got any Frosties? <laughs> Apple and pear. Are Cheerios cheeries? <laughs> I love Danny's fake accent. I love when you really like <laughs> lean into it. Yeah, because then I just piss off the English people and Irish people. <laughs> yeah. at the same I always time. pissed off that. Exactly. Uh, this uh, this, this uh, uh, linguistic podcast, of course, this is also a podcast. You can uh, listen to us on the iTunes and uh, on SoundCloud. And we're, we're now on Stitcher, which apparently, I don't even know what that is. People I love were like, it already. People were like, are you on Stitcher? I was like, I don't know. And then I typed in putting podcasts on Stitcher. Now we're on Stitcher. All right. So you can stitch to your heart's Good job, <laughs> behind the scenes team. Stitch it up. Yeah. yeah. That, that was just me. Oh, it's just good yeah. job, Danny. Thanks. Appreciate it, Scott. Uh, and thanks Sorry, to everyone who's been give you credit. <laughs> thanks to everyone who's been reviewing us as well on uh, on on the iTunes store, uh, the various iTunes stores because they split them up by region. Uh, thank you so much to Jeff Ein who said Jeff Ein uh, who said uh, my favorite weekly video game live show is now available in convenient audio format, smart conversational style, great mix of guests. And a one-stop shop. <laughs> I couldn't, literally could not have written this better myself. <laughs> uh, even if I tried. Uh, a one-stop shop for all the stuff happening in the world of video games. Except petting animals. Suspiciously positive. Yeah, yeah. I know. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, check, <laughs> checks in the mail. Uh, let's get into it. Uh, for those who are watching on Twitch, on GameSpot, on YouTube, I will be in the, the chat uh, pulling out your questions, especially for these three segments about the various games we're going to talk about. So yeah. let's, uh, let's jump right into it. Scott, you reviewed two zombie games last week. We'll get to the plants... Later on, that didn't even click did in not, my brain that they were realize? both technically zombie games. In wow, that's mind. weird that I never put those two <laughs> together. But yeah, you're exactly right. You yeah, didn't, you didn't realize that you were hired as our zombie enthusiast. Apparently, yeah, well, whole... in my defense, they are extremely different games. I mean, <laughs> PVZ is obviously like very like cute and funny and family yeah. friendly. Dying Light is very like. It's bleak, especially mm. like for anybody that's finished the DLC, like you know exactly how bleak it gets. It's uh, pretty intense. Cool. But they're both they're both great for, for different reasons. Mm. I really enjoyed both of them, honestly. Uh, the, yeah, the following got an eight out of ten yeah. on GameSpot. Uh, interesting looking expansion. I remember a couple of months ago they like put the the price up because they'd been like adding so much to it. Uh, yeah. So it's nineteen ninety nine now. It's like a fully fledged kind of like 
almost feels like a standalone thing. Very yeah. different what they've done. They, they've, you know, for a game about parkour, it's like basically out in the middle of the countryside. Yeah. So like the, for anybody that didn't play the original, it was based primarily on like a, a parkour traversal system. It was, you know, weapon crafting and zombie killing and parkour. Mm. And now this DLC is, hey, you have a customizable buggy and can just drive around the countryside, which feels like the antithesis of yeah. parkouring through buildings and stuff. So kind of a weird design decision, which is why it's kind of amazing that it works so well. Like, mm. not, not only do the driving mechanics themselves actually function beautifully, it, it melds with the existing gameplay really well. I mean, it builds on the existing weapon crafting system, so, like, that all feels very familiar. Um, it's It all just kind of works, in a mm. way. Um, and it, it, it ends up being super fun. So um, what's it like, sort of, to, to, I guess you need to have a good driving model for a game that's going to be set outside um, in the <laughs> wilderness. What's it like uh, traversing that big open area? What's the buggy feel like? Like, uh, there's like upgrades and whatnot for it as well. Yeah, that's actually sort of the best part. Um, so to be clear, Dying Light is not a standalone. It, it, it has enough content that it could have been. Yeah, but it is uh, an expansion to the existing game. So you carry all, everything that you earned in the original game into the DLC. So that means that if you play to the end of Dying Light, you're pretty much all the way leveled up. Mm. So the nice thing about the DLC is it gives you this new skill tree to level up. So you have something to work towards, and that skill tree is your buggy. So you're earning upgrades. You're adding stuff to it. You're like equipping it with flamethrowers and UV headlights, which stun zombies, things like that. So that whole process of building up your buggy is super satisfying. Mm. But it also maintains the sort of survival element of like you have to go out and scavenge for gas and scavenge for parts. And, you know, your buggy will deteriorate the more you drive it and you have to keep it running. Um, so, again, that's part of why it all melts together and works so well with the existing experience. So, yeah, upgrades, awesome. Flamethrowers, awesome. It's, it's uh, weird because I, 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 I was playing Mad Max over the, the holiday break. Uh, and I also play Half-Life 2 basically every year. And this kind of felt I, I played a little bit of this and it felt like the Highway 17 levels of Half-Life 2 mixed with this like... Like you're, yeah, like you're saying, collecting all these resources. No, absolutely. I was actually talking with somebody. I think that was even a line in the review at one point that ended up getting cut that it's sort of a better Mad Max than Mad Max. <laughs> right, yeah. Because it actually has like the survival elements and, mm. and the satisfaction of building up the car and making it your own is actually sort of better than it was in the Mad Max game, um, which was not a terrible game. But it's, yeah, this DLC kind of nails it without really necessarily aiming for that it mm. just kind of like i said fits with the existing experience and just becomes mad max on accident yeah, yeah. <laughs> a game that you loved <laughs> <laughs> that was actually the very first lobby i ever watched because I, I, I remember oh, really? being yeah. like oh yeah the peter brown guy's got a good head and shoulders feel yeah. bad because everyone in the comments hates him <laughs> that was I, i've since gone back and yeah. played mad max because i hadn't played mad max you gave it a six out of ten yeah like i'm i'm totally with you like it's it's a totally competent game that's like uh, it looks it looks really pretty. The driving was really fun, but the sort of stuff you're describing about the buggy, which should be this sort of like organic relationship with your car, mm. so you really grow attached to it. The game like forced objectives through forced upgrades. Right. So you were like, I have to upgrade my buggy this way or that way to continue the story, and it just felt so prescribed and clinical. Mm. It was like I don't know. And even the resource gathering in Mad Max was not that imperative to your success. Mm. I found. Yeah. But, you know, whatever. I mean. It's, it's cool to see that Dying Light did so well, especially yeah. because it's so different. And they've even said now that in 2016, they're going to make more content for the game. Right. Because the following has just done so well for them. Yeah, it should. I mean, it's, it's one of my favorite pieces of DLC, like, maybe ever. Mm. Uh, it just... Because it, it does something that's both new... I mean, the, the way I phrased it in the reviews, it's both... It's at once distinct from and in sync with the original experience. I think that that's what makes it so impressive. Yeah. That it does something new, and it works, and it feels natural. Uh, like all of those elements combined with something that's just fun, like driving around and mowing down zombies. Like, I don't really know what more you could want at a DLC. Yeah. I mean, um, DLC it, usually just like adds something to, you know, a sort of a base game that's like just complementary almost, or, or yeah, like yeah. fits in really neatly. Whereas this almost seems like they just had this whole idea of a different game. They're just like, screw it. Let's yeah. just do this. And, yeah. and it works. Um, I mean, it wasn't perfect. It still got an eight out of 10, but. No, I mean, I highly recommend it. An 8 out of 10, in my mind, is like an mm. excellent score. What was the combat like, considering like this was a game that was based around melee yeah. combat, like a really difficult sort of, you know, in Dying Light, when you use weapons, they break apart, especially at the start when you haven't sort of upgraded your, your, your character's ability to like, I don't, I don't know, the durability of the weapons. Like stuff falls apart really quickly. What's it like suddenly having a car that you can basically just mow down zombies in? Well, like I said, so the car does break down too. So oh, you're right. not completely off the hook. Um, like the more, the more you drive off road and the more zombies you hit, like things will just start to fall apart to, mm. to, the, to the point that eventually your buggy will just like not be drivable anymore if right. you're not repairing it actively. Um, so it doesn't make the game like too easy. It doesn't really break the game. Um, and, and really the, the new setting kind of changes the way you have to approach combat. Because you're right, in, in the original game it was very melee focused. You were very up close and personal. And uh, in this, having so much space, it, it means both 
not having cover anymore, not having a, a convenient means of escape. You can't just like climb up on a van and like be above the fray and mm. find a way out. You know, you actually have no choice but to engage the zombies that are after you or to like get in your buggy and run. Um, so it does change the way you approach combat. So you, you end up uh, using ranged weapons a lot more. You actually right. there's this great tactical crossbow you get as you play through uh, the DLC that's phenomenal. But also, if you still have any firearms from the original game, those work great. I highly recommend them. They're much safer than trying to melee like a huge horde of zombies that you can't get away from anymore. Mm. Um, so yeah, it fundamentally changes the way you approach combat without actually doing any like introducing any new combat mechanics. Right. Which is another reason that I think the DLC works so well. Yeah, it's really qu- quite an achievement. Uh, thanks to everyone who's been sending in questions via the chat. Uh, uh, yes, as as you can see, the folks in the back are just throwing up all your questions. So please, by all means, get them in there. At Daniel Dwyer, if you want me to see them uh, here on my laptop as well. Uh, let's talk briefly about, without getting too much into the, the story stuff, uh, how is the story? Does it pay off? Yeah, I mean, uh, I've seen some comments, so I don't want to spoil the ending because it really goes in like a, a pretty, pretty gnarly direction. Um, a lot of people really hated it. I, I admired oh, really? that they made a bold choice with the way they wrap it up, but the sort of the premise is... Donald Trump's president at the end. Yes. Great. It's terrifying. <laughs> Zombie Donald Trump. Device. Zom- yeah. <laughs> no, so Donald Trump. Zombie Trump. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <It's> fair enough. <laughs> um, speaking of brains. Uh, <laughs> Um, let's see. Oh, cult. Yeah. So the basic premise is um, at the end, at the end of Dying Life, for me, hasn't finished it. Like you're still in a city overrun with zombies. Like mm. I won't spoil how that game wraps up, but at the end of the game, like you're still in a city. There are still zombies. Mm. So this DLC starts with a random person from outside of town showing up and being like, "Hey, there's a way out." And by the way, there's also a place where people are immune to this epidemic. Okay, I'm gonna die now, and then he dies. Well, yeah. And you take his map and find your way out, and then you're suddenly in the countryside, and you discover that. There's like this whole cult situation and you have to infiltrate the cult to try to figure out how people are like immune to the zombie virus. And you have like a standing with them? Like yeah, a, you like basically have to earn their trust because they're very mistrustful of outsiders. They don't know who you are. They don't you know, want to reveal anything to you. And of course, like the, the whole rabbit hole of this cult, the whole conspiracy goes very deep. And so mm. you just peel back, you know, the onion layers. Um, but so that does mean, and this is one of my biggest problems with the DLC actually, uh, you end up doing a lot of just fetch quests as favors to right. earn trust. It's like, Oh, gee whiz, I don't want to tell you about this thing, so why don't you go talk to this guy on the opposite side of the map for no reason? Yeah. Like, ah, so there's a lot of that, which is unfortunate. Um, but in terms of narrative payoff, it does actually work. Like, it's annoying having to do so many fetch quests, but at least there's a compelling reason to do them. And, like, there is sort of a payoff, and it does kind of go somewhere. And, and I appreciate that it becomes a conspiracy thriller rather than just a generic, you know, oh, there are zombies, we have to kill them, survive. Yeah. You know, like every other zombie game. So it's a pretty novel approach for an apocalypse-style setting, mm. which is cool. I was thinking it'd be great if there was a zombie game where you had to try your best to actually get bitten, but the zombies just don't want anything to do with you. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, like, going out of your way, like, Zombie dating sim. Come on. <laughs> yeah. There you it's go. It's like driver. Every time we try and knock somebody down, they just go, whoop. And get out of the way. Uh, before we wrap this up, I got some questions from the chat coming in here. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mammoth EU saying, uh, Dying Light, the following is exactly what DLC should look like. Such great value for money. It is nineteen ninety nine. I know it's 60 bucks with the base game as well they're selling. Yeah. Right? So actually, there's a special edition, like definitive edition of the entire game that you can buy for $60, which does include the following DLC. Mm. So if you never played the original that's probably your best bet because you can upgrade and play through the original game and then carry all that into the DLC and it's all in one convenient package. Cool. Uh, Shooty78 says, how long is the following? The guy's name is Shooty78. Shooty78. That's awesome. He's I guess he tw- likes shooters. He's tw- 38 years, 30 something years old. 38. Math. Yeah, math, math, yeah. yeah. We're editors. We shooting. Words, words, not numbers. Uh, uh, yeah, scores how- are dumb. Words are great. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it, I mean, you can beat the sort of campaign of the DLC in probably about 10 hours. Okay. Um, so it's pretty substantial, but there's also plenty of stuff to just go and find. Like people are already uncovering all these Easter eggs all throughout the yeah. world map. So you can just kind of drive around and focus on finding upgrades and, and crafting stuff and discovering hidden areas, things like that. So all things considered for completionists, like there's probably like 20 hours of content to cool. this DLC, which is substantial. And uh, last question here from Lord the LMV. Uh, is parkour still a big part of the game? Yeah, actually. So, I mean, you spend a lot of time commuting between locations, but once you get to those locations, very often there is room to kind of parkour. Mm. And you can still incorporate it in, in combat. Like, there are boss encounters that happen in the kind of enclosed areas. And if you're good at parkour, you can use that to your advantage to, you know, avoid dying. Um, and, and co-op is still a thing, by the way, for anybody that's wondering. You can still play all of this in co-op. Cool. Your buddies can actually jump in the back of your buggy and you can like <laughs> do, you know, ride around in a buggy together. It's great. Your very own chum bucket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can just kick them off and keep driving as a distraction, right? You don't have to outrun the bears. Just gotta outrun the guy next Excellent. to you. Bear zombie, you know. 
Nice. So, yeah. I like it. Uh, that's it. Dying like the following. It's out. Well, it's been out already, but it's out now on uh, on PC, I guess. Uh, on PC or let's see, PC, Xbox One, and PS4. Oh wow! All right. Yeah, I forgot it was out on consoles. One yeah. of those games. It looks really good as well. It Still does. Looks good. It really does. Yeah. And actually, the new setting allows it to. So I mean, it's it's bright and yeah. there's coastline and water. It's very nice. It's yeah, very yeah. pretty. It's super good. Thanks so much, Scott. For Absolutely. Talk to Spanish. Uh, how you doing, Peter? Oh, I'm good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so good. No, it's your it's turn now. No, dude. I mean, you, you've got plenty to say, so I'm going to let you do it. I'm just going to sit here and try to look pretty. Well, here's something both of you can talk about, because both of you are uh, virtual reality fans, evangelists. I don't know. You're folks who <laughs> have a, had experience with VR more than most people here in the office. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Scott, you recently went over and played with the HTC Vive, the yes. Valve VR, um, uh, up in, was it in Seattle? It was in up? Seattle, yes. Cool. Uh, and obviously, Peter, you've been using them, but you had a really interesting experience last year where you, you, or earlier this year, where you used the Oculus and the HTC Vive within like five minutes of each other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very illuminating. Um, would you love to hear about it? Yeah. Uh, in a second, because yes, we've just had the news that uh, the Vive is going to be starting pre-orders in sometime in April, apparently. Okay. So you can start pre-ordering on February 29th. It'll oh. start shipping in April. Okay. So 29th, that's less like, than a week ago. Yeah, yeah. It's so next um, month's Monday. And, and then people will start getting their systems in April. So like that's right around the corner. It's happening. Uh, yeah. But they do need to pony up $800 yes. for the package. But let's talk about the value there. Because yes. Because the Oculus Rift headset is 600 if I'm correct. 600 yes. And with that, you get the... Xbox One pad, which almost feels superfluous in a weird way. Yeah. Like, I feel like the people who would be buying that might already have that, but yeah. Probably. And the headset, right? And that's yes. it. With the Vive, you get the headset, two of their their controllers, which are new, brand new, built for VR. They mm. really do make those experiences feel distinct and special. And you get the cameras that you use for positional tracking. Which are like those like four little... Do hickeys yeah, and yeah. Uh, lighthouse sensors. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and all of those combined just make like a really good experience for VR that Oculus is like close to hitting, but yeah. they're just not there yet because you can't, you can walk around a small amount of space with the Oculus Rift on, but you can't do the full room experience. And they don't have the tech that HTC has put into their headset either that will detect when something's in front of you and give you sort of like a ghostly image of it so you don't bump into it. Yeah. But also they're not taking you out of the game. It's just like a subtle nudge, like, just, by the way, there's a wall there. Mm. So it doesn't break immersion either. Uh, is this like, you know, obviously people are saying, oh my God, we're so used to spending, you know, $400 for a console or $500 for a console. And, you know, maybe PCs obviously cost more, a lot more. Um, do you think people are disappointed at this price point? Are we, are we now at the stage where the, like sort of the internet community, is, the gaming community has kind of figured out that, okay, actually VR is going to cost this much money no matter what? Uh, I kind of look at it this way, right? Like whenever a GPU manufacturer announces their best card, you know, it costs somewhat similar to what people are going to be paying for these mm. headsets. Um, and frankly, if you were to take VR below the high-end experience right now, you would have something that is not really desirable. Mm. So yes, it's the only option, but it's a reasonable option when you consider the, the sort of the envelope that exists for this technology right now. You don't want to be at the bottom. You want to be at the top. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's why I don't feel too bad about it. Also, it's, you know, these are the first headsets that are hitting the market that are offering something that is better than just a a base level experience so you can say you used VR. They're offering things that allow you to actually engage with games in a way that does feel different and does feel really good. Yeah, in fact, let's just talk about the games. We're here, GameSpot. Let's talk about video games. Mm -hmm. I feel like when we talk about VR half the time, it's always about tech demos. I mean, yesterday yeah. they released their tech demo thing on uh, over Steam as well, where you can, people have been actually data mining that for some really interesting Half-Life 3 stuff. <laughs> Did you see any of that? I saw some of always. it, yeah. yeah, it just, like a head crab reference here, <laughs> HL3 there, like, okay. Well, apparently, yeah, Half-Life 3 had some sort of quest system. You gotta imagine to... people at Valve are just doing that to that? with us. You think so? <laughs> yeah. Just like, I mean, just messing with it a little point, bit? At this point, or even just joke with each other internally. Like, just, oh, good one, Steve. Yeah, I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> HL3 actually stands for, like, hollow lamp. <laughs> three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's exactly right. Uh, Half-Life 3 aside, uh, yeah. <laughs> you were up there, you played 12 games in a row. Yes, yeah, so this was just a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, Steam, so um, Valve hosted the Steam VR Showcase, which was basically, here are 12 games that are all coming out this year, coming to HTC Vive. Right. So everything I played is going to be out at some point within the next, like, six to eight months, most likely. Cool. Um, yeah, and, and what was cool about it is, as you mentioned, you know, previously we've seen a lot of tech demos, but what I was playing up in Seattle were actually games, like games that I could see myself sitting down and playing What's for this fun. Game? What's this guy uh, That. Oh, it's raw data. Oh, that is raw data. That one I actually played a little more recently. That's also a Vive game. 
it's sort of a combination like tower defense slash like standing light gun shooter. Okay. Uh, you're basically waiting for a computer to like download some stuff for you and you have to defend the computer. S- sounds familiar. From a robot assassins <laughs> who are trying to stop you. So you're basically your motion controllers are guns and you can get oh, like wow. a bow or a I'll, shotgun. Yeah, I like the sword situation here. Uh, actually, in fact, you, there's a couple of games you're playing here. I see like Tilt Brush, uh, Budget Cuts, Job Simulator. How many of these games are games where you were standing in one position? And um, uh, quite, I mean, definitely a few. Uh, what was interesting though is that they all did something really different. I mean, of the 12 games that I, that I went and saw in Seattle, each one was very i mean they were all very different and they were almost all different genres there were a couple shooters but other than that it was it was pretty pretty interesting i mean there was a mini golf game there was like a, a you know cool. a couple sort of puzzly games that approached puzzles in in different ways uh, a couple shooters a stealth game you know a top down god mode game uh, mm. just a bunch of different stuff and and like i said it was all stuff that i could actually see myself playing like they were real games not just tech demos which yeah. was what was so exciting about it stuff i could anticipate and like want to play uh, I guess last question on this coming away from the game stuff is that there was a Mobile World Congress I think is on in Barcelona at the moment. Um, was that where Zuckerberg was on stage with? Yeah, Samsung was doing their press conference right. and they gave everyone in the audience the Gear VR headset, which yeah. is the thing that you can take one of your various Samsung phones and dock into it and get pretty good VR Oh, one of my Samsung phones? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> which no, one that, will I put in? Well, I mean, one of many. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know you all have a few, right? <laughs> I mean, at E3 probably. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and there is this image that was sort of like, we've hit this point in VR now where all our worst fears come true, <laughs> yeah. where you're in a VR headset and all of a sudden Mark Zuckerberg is walking around with a goofy <laughs> smile and a tight t-shirt. That's yeah. my yeah. army. Yeah, the exactly. tweet The tweet that I well, saw was like... Yeah. Uh, uh, Black Mirror season three, or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's yeah. the image. Yeah, that's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's very it's creepy. Very, <laughs> yeah, for the podcast viewers, I'm sure if you type Zuckerberg VR, you'll you'll get yeah. that shot. Most uh, likely. Yeah, but are at least with the HTC Vive sort of coming back to it, are they looking? Have they, you know, sort of talked about getting into that weird space of oh, this is also like a communication machine, which is very much like what I feel I experienced with the Oculus. Right. Uh, touch demo and yeah. with the reason why Facebook bought it, right? I don't think, uh, I think it's a good reason, a part of the reason why they bought it. I don't think we're going to see like really dedicated first party social apps like mm. the way we imagine them now. I think it's going to be sort of a, a slow build up to something that is like a really concerted focused effort on like this is the social platform for VR. Um, so if anything, I don't think you're going to see Valve do too much with it. Maybe they'll integrate Steam in a way. They are integrating sort of local social stuff where you can like get phone calls in the Vive headset, which right. is which is a good thing. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't see anyone any one company really going all in on social stuff right now because that's the first way to like trigger fears that people are already expressing before these things are even out. Right. That somehow this is going to like remove them from reality and like mm. blah blah blah. I think people need to get way more comfortable with this technology before they're willing to like feel comfortable interfacing on a regular basis with a headset on. Yeah. But it does work really well, as you saw. Uh, at, at Gamescom. Yeah, the Oculus Touch thing. That was the one that turned me into, oh yeah, this shit is incredible. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And Which it, is hard to... Yeah, It's an uphill battle trying to explain that to people who have never tried it because it's like right. you can't yeah. communicate the sensation. It's like holding a Wiimote. Like that shit, like the dorkiest piece of shit in the world. And, it was, <laughs> and then I remember like playing it yeah. in, a, in like a... They had like a Wii station and it was actually in like a supermarket in Birmingham in the north of England. Ah, <laughs> uh, that was, old supermarket. I know, right? Yeah, yeah the, bull, the, the bull ring itself, itself. And I was there and I literally had to go with tennis and was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. So uh, I guess maybe this will help people. Actually, one question here, the last one, it's, um, uh, we'll actually give it to Josh Shaw, who's inside uh, helping direct the show. Uh, he says, I can't wear a VR headset for uh, maybe for over maybe an hour before feeling bad. You played games for like a whole day. What was that like? Yeah, so the, the schedule for the event that I attended was, it was six hours, uh, and I played games in 15-minute bursts for right. like a cumulative total of three hours of play time. Mm. Uh, and so just playing 15 minutes and taking the headset off, I was fine. The only motion sickness I ever experienced was uh, playing, not not E Valkyrie, what's the other one? Um, the other space sim. Oh, Elite Dangerous? Elite Dangerous, yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, and, and that was only because like I was driving a buggy around like a low gravity planet and like <laughs> flipping off dunes and stuff, so I was doing it to myself. Um, so I was fine. I did find it, Every time I took the headset off, it, w- it was more and more difficult to reacclimate to reality. Like right. after having so many times taking the headset off and on, like, yeah. I kind of had to actually consciously remind myself by then, like, oh, okay, headset's off, back in the real world. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's it can be a little exhausting, but I, I think that, you know, the more people use it, the more they'll get used to it. And I, honestly, I think I think it'll be fine. Mm. I didn't have too much trouble with it. Um, but then again, I'm not 
generally prone to motion sickness or anything like that. I, I didn't find it uncomfortable or anything. I wonder like if, physically uncomfortable. I wonder if that's a thing where people are like, kind of. I don't want to spend eight hundred dollars just in case. Like, I don't know <laughs> if it's gonna make me sick at home. I'm really hoping for like the reemergence of like cyber cafes where you can just go oh, and like try this for a while, oh. right? Like, a, you know what I'm talking about? A bunch of stories that, that make sense. Oh, you're you're going to see it in, in airplanes, I think. That's, yeah. that's not too far off, especially in first class. But def- cool. I think give it five years, you're going to start seeing like, maybe if not that, like, you know, you're seeing like a lot of uh, smart devices in airports now, like at little tables where people are waiting. Now, granted, hygiene is a problem, but uh, yeah, I mean, you could see VR headsets in scenarios like that as well. Yes, I remember uh, it was a Theresa Derringer who was created um, the Cannon Brawl, who was an artist on mm. that game. They're making, yeah. they've made a great VR game as well. I forget what it's called. Bizarre. Uh, and she has a problem flying. She's like deathly afraid of flying. And she basically went on a uh, across America trip and used yeah. her, um, I guess it was the Samsung VR she used, uh, or Samsung, the what's it called? VR. The Gear VR, sorry. Uh, and it like completely mitigated her her sickness or yeah. her like her anxiety. So yeah, yeah, yeah it's weird. It's going to be interesting to see where this stuff ends up. Uh, thank you both for coming in and yeah. talking about virtual reality. Uh, let us know in the chat <laughs> if you're interested in picking up uh, an HTC or an Oculus, which one? Spin that extra 200 bones or whatever it is uh, for, for the extra sensors. Let us know in the chat and the comments below. Gentlemen, I'm excited about the future of VR. It's I coming. It's a little bit outside my price my my price point, maybe by Christmas, maybe a little bit. Give time. it time, yeah. man. Yeah. It'll get there. Yeah, if by, if by future, you mean like two or three years from now. I'm also yeah. excited for that. Yeah. In terms of the next six to eight months, it's a little iffier, but we'll see. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of people getting rid of their sofas. <laughs> Craig's listing their sofas. Maybe, and maybe. Turning their houses into into that stuff. Uh, let's get back on the zombie train, shall we? Sure, why not? S- Scott, you're here. Hello. You are the zombie still here. master. You're still sti- talking about zombies. Yeah, we're not done with you yet. Almost two years to the day from the f- release of the first Plants vs. Zombie games Activision have put out. Sh- it's a shooter franchise that they're running that they're not putting out every year. So that's a, that's It's nice. Wonderful. And it's a shooter franchise based on a what started as a flash tower defense game. Yeah. So like, kudos to them for s- like effectively spinning this universe into a shooter franchise like in a way that is cute and <laughs> fun and interesting and actually funny yeah like that's pretty impressive honestly like not awful like that i guess yeah. candy crush <laughs> shooter <laughs> candy sa- candy warfare coming soon yeah hopefully <laughs> not uh yeah it's, it's far from awful um I, I enjoyed it quite a bit i mean I, I had a few problems with it uh mm. interestingly so of the three reviews that i mentioned at the top of the show here mm. uh firewatch uh the dying light dlc and plants vs zombies garden warfare 2 uh, I got the most hate for my Garden Warfare 2 review, which really? was sort of interesting. Really? Yes. So the first game, people were kind of cautious or surprised, I think, by how fun it was or how well received it was, sort of waiting to see that that, that train wreck come in to pull into the <laughs> station. But wh- wait, why were people... Uh, I think it's one of those games that, you know, the audience isn't massive, but the people who love it really love it right. and were a little defensive or upset with me for not loving it as much as they do, I Wait, think. Wait, what score did I get? Uh, so I got a 7 out of 10, okay. which, as I always say, is not a bad score. No, I mean, it's people, literally a good score. Yeah, yeah. it says so right <laughs> under the number. I mean, we're not IGN. We actually score. We use the whole scale. Yeah, uh, I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> throwing shade there, Danny. But, I mean, it's, it's kind of true that on, like, if you go to, like, Reddit or NeoGAF, there's there's an ongoing joke of, like, oh, it's horrible, the graphics are bad, 9 out of 10 IGN. Like, yeah. right? Like, you'll see that everywhere. So we're kind of actively Sorry, trying guys. to not... <laughs> I mean, fall into the Metacritic trap of like yeah. a seven is mediocre. Like you go to Metacritic and a seven is has the yellow background, like it's bad. Like no, yeah. like we are attempting to use the whole scale. A seven is good. It says good. Mm. I, I know that that doesn't fit with certain people's perceptions <laughs> of numbers. Uh, but like I always say, seven's a good score. Mm. Games can arrive at the same score for very different reasons. Like a seven for one game is not the same as a seven for another. You, know, Wait, you mean they don't <laughs> add up like all the various features to like one score? No, 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 no. You Ugh. start at 10 and you take away for everyone that's not I, That's right. <laughs> I was talking with someone in the comments about that and explaining like, look, that's not how we do scores. We kind of just start at neutral and then experience the game and then, you know, synthesize all of our thoughts into a number at the end. Like mm. we're not knocking stuff off in some kind of mathematical way. We don't start at 10 and work our way down. Like we're just trying to deliver a number that speaks to the overall quality of the game. And this is another thing I always tell people, like, read the text. Like, I spend so much more time on the text than on the score. Like, yeah. I think very deeply about the number that I'm I giving mean, the game. I mean, the number is literally the, the final part of the equation. Oh, yeah, yeah we, we, we never really start with a number unless it's yeah. something that is just so phenomenal or 
so abysmal. Yes, yeah, the times yeah. I've only ever seen during the review process, uh, the the number coming into the equation is either the reviewer telegraphing that, yo, this might be a 10, right. or this is real uh, yeah. stinker. Does the text reflect what I'm thinking of giving it? But yeah, that stuff sort of changes. I wish we could change the, the word under one to stinker. <laughs> stinker? What is it now? <laughs> Abys- Not stinker. Ab- abysmal is one of them, yeah, which is I a think, great word. Yeah, it, it is. is a good word. Uh, I don't know. Totally agree that a seven should be good, says Estran23. Thank you. Uh, let's get let's get back on the on the rails here. Right. Yeah. Plants vs. Zombie. <laughs> uh, Garden Warfare 2. So this yes. is a game that's got a single player campaign, it's got a multiplayer um thing going on as well, and then it's got its little co-op uh, sort of part of it. Let's talk about the single player first of all. Not too deep, it sounds. Yeah, it's not great. Um so this this was an, an interesting one because the the first Garden Warfare was a forty dollar game and did not have really any solo content yeah. at all, uh, much less an actual campaign. Campaign. So it was sort of a big deal that this game actually does have a campaign. The only issue is that it's very content light and the content that exists is just sort of a remix of other content that exists elsewhere in the game. Right. So the game is structured around a hub world now. So instead of just a menu system, you actually inhabit this sort of physical space and there are mm. portals to the different game modes and you can wander around and find stuff in the hub world. Cool. Um, so that's pretty cool. But the way the, the campaign works is typically a campaign mission will be like, hey, go to this location in the hub world and fetch this thing. Again, back to just like meaningless fetch quests. Yeah. So there's not like dedicated environments or like set pieces are really much storytelling like you'll mm. get some framing text exposition dumps right at the beginning of each mission and then you'll just go do a thing and you'll come back and yeah you're done that's like literally every mission the only exception is when you get thrown into a garden ops or graveyard ops match which is the game's cooperative mode where right it's you and three other people or three ai uh fighting against waves of enemies while trying to defend a central you know location mm. so it's you know it's it's either a game mode that exists or go find stuff in the hub world it's right. not. It's not great. Um, and and people had actually asked me like, well, would the game have gotten a better score if it hadn't had single player at all? Mm. And the answer is no, because that would have solved the problem of the single player being not great, but it would have created a new problem of there being sort of like a dearth of content or yes. something extra to sort of games entice I, you to yeah. So like I mean, games that had single player <laughs> yeah. sometimes a problem. Peter, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to Street Fighter in a little bit maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Street Fighter is an interesting one. Um, but yeah, so the solo content, not great. Um, and, and for me, I really enjoyed the multiplayer quite a bit, but it wasn't quite enough to compensate for the fact that the solo, cam- solo campaign was like just not, yeah, just not very good. Garden Up stuff, um, is that interesting? Garden Up stuff is, is really fun. Actually, one of the best aspects of this new game is you can actually use uh, AI allies for every mode now. In the, in the previous game, that wasn't always the case. Okay. So you can actually jump into the cooperative mode with computer-controlled players and actually swap a hot swap among them. So like whatever four characters you choose to oh. bring in, you can actually jump between them at will, That's cool. which is really cool. So yeah. if you're playing by yourself, it makes it a lot more like winnable, basically. Mm. And, and kind of it adds a new sort of fun dynamic. So that was really cool. I'm really glad they did that. Um, you'd also play a lot of the multiplayer modes solo by bringing in AI, which cool. is also really cool. Yeah, well, I mean, um, that's yeah, that sort of adds something to the single-player elements of the game. Yeah. Um, uh, let's talk about the multiplayer stuff then as well. They've yeah. bumped up the amount of characters. It's up to 14 now, three new characters for either side. Yes, that's correct. Like, okay, is it still, like, that seems like a lot of, like... yeah. Well, characters to sort of understand like coming in like we were playing Overwatch again recently and you really have to like spend time to figure out what everyone does how does the balancing act feel in this yeah god it's uh, I mean it's I, I wouldn't call it overwhelming but I think it's important to understand that those 14 characters are all extremely distinct from one another it's not like oh, like, you kind of have a medic class, and, oh, you kind of have, like, the grenadier guy. It's like, no, no, no. Mm. Like, they have different movement speeds, different levels of health, different, you know, jump heights, different primary weapons. Like, they are mechanically extremely distinct from one another. So learning how each matchup kind of works is crucial to being good at the game. And is there some, like, variety within those classes then as well? There is. Right. Um, so there are 110 total character variants right and each of those variants has something that's mechanically (laughs) distinct about them Mm. um so that's the 14 base characters but then you'll so like there's pea shooter right but then there's also rock p who's like a like heavier more armored version of that character who has like less ammo before he has to reload but also has more health uh so like that's sort of an, an example of a variant on a base character there are 110 of those uh it takes an eternity to unlock all of them but uh yeah, it's again, it, it makes matchups in the game super important because you have to know what you're up against and how to sort of counteract the strategy that, you, that you're, you've encountered on the battlefield. Mm. Uh, it, it lends a lot of strategic depth and it actually makes the game much richer than you might expect for something that looks so cute. Mm. But 
the fact that everything unlocks so slowly is is pretty frustrating. Right. And trying to sort of manage all of that is also a little overwhelming without sort of at least having some kind of background with, with the original game. Because if you don't know what the classes do and how they interact, like you're, you're going to lose much. a lot online. It's so strange. It's almost like, remember when Viva Pinata came out and you're like, oh, they're making this like game that's, you know, they're we're launching a cartoon show alongside of it and it's going to be for kids and Rare are making it. And then it's like the hardest motherfucking thing in the world. Right. Like it's this a little of, bit like that. Right? It's like, yeah. yeah, I'm super curious. Like, is there an audience that's missing out on this game because of the way it's dressed? Probably, like, yeah. Because it, everyone seems to rave about it, but I look at it just purely just like superficial re- yeah. you know, uh, perspective and it's just like, I just don't, I don't want that. I th- the but art design everyone, looks incredible. I mean, it yeah. looks, it, but it, yes, but it doesn't speak to me necessarily, right, yeah. but when I hear about the gameplay, it's like, well, shit, like I would do that. Yeah, it's, it's right. super inventive, just like the different types of characters and the different sort of mechanics built into these characters. I mean, it's not just, oh, shooty, shooty, bang, bang, everyone right. dead. Like, <laughs> you could, you know, there's a character that burrows underground and can, like, eat characters from underneath. Like, there's just all these unique mechanics you wouldn't encounter typically in an online shooter, which to me is the core strength of this game. Like, that is the biggest reason to play this game. It is a well-made, robust shooter that does inventive things with its mechanics that other games aren't even attempting. So that's, to me, what makes it a good game. There are other things that hold it back, but if there's a reason to play Garden Warfare 2, that's that's it. Like yeah. the mechanical diversity, the incredible creativity of its characters, and just like the process of learning how all of that interacts online. It's really interesting. There you go. Scott, thank you so much. Sure. Uh, Garden Warfare, Plants vs. Zombies. Garden yes. Warfare 2 to give its full title uh, out today title. in North America, out on Friday uh, worldwide. So there you go. What's it out on? It's on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation 4. Correct. Yeah, yeah. There you go. The triumvirate. The trifecta, as it were. Uh, actually, one interesting comment that came in here from uh, Blessed Ignorant in the in the chat. Uh, we're conditioned to think that eight uh, below eight is not worth the time or money, perhaps due to time and financial constraints. That's a good point. Maybe we all have like, there's like that internal barometer where you're like, you know what? If something is an eight or a nine or a 10, I'm like, that's wi- that's like willing to take a punt on. Whereas seven makes it a little bit more uncomfortable. It's like, oh, I don't know. That's yeah. the end result, but what's the actual like source of that? I don't know that if it's necessarily time and money that make you feel like a seven isn't great. Mm. Like when did we learn that a seven means it's not worth your precious little time? Yeah, maybe only if there's like a game that's got an ace sitting right beside it. A shiny <laughs> Like that idea that, because like that's one of the things I feel like I've, I actually lost this when I started working at a game store, Mm because then I had access to all these cheap games, which is that I used to be a lot more precious about like, oh, I can buy that and not buy that. And then when I had this like, whatever, 30% discount at GameStop, it was like, oh, this is amazing. Like I can get whatever the hell I want. How many times did you base your purchasing decisions on reviews? Pretty often, I feel. But, but, But with a very underlying bias of what I thought beforehand. Yeah. Well, like, yeah, of course. Reviews were like yeah. the the last hurdle where it was like, I kind of feel like this is something I want already. And then reviews is like just making sure that it's not like a total train wreck. Just kind <laughs> of <laughs> validating that you're making the right yes. choice in a way. Like you yeah. kind of know what you want to do, what you need to confirm that you're not about to do something stupid. Yeah. Yeah. God bless confirmation bias. So I, like I a seven that makes that a little bit, maybe, I don't know. Peter actually made a really interesting point long ago to me that's really stuck with me, which is that it's, it's really not up to reviewers to determine the value of a dollar anyway. I mean, so if you're you know working in a game store and you know you don't have a ton of excess income to just throw at games, yeah. you're going to be a little more cautious about the games that you actually buy. But that's not everyone. There are plenty of people who you know work here in San Francisco who have tons of extra income who can just Ugh. like throw 60 bucks yeah. at a game without even thinking about it. <laughs> or a so, fucking hoverboard. Or hoverboard. Oh, there's so many. <laughs> Oh, uh, so many. Jesus. But so it's not up to us to decide that like, oh, well, if you know, if we give it a seven, that means no one's going to buy it. It's like, well, who are, yes, people have different yeah. thresholds for what they're willing to spend money on. So, I mean, that's for us, it's, it's, it's not a productive way to look at scoring a game. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. The battle continues. I know. Oh, the, world uh, is, yes. the world of video game reviews. Um, we're, very, we're very brave. <laughs> yes. It's a hard job. But somebody's got to do it. We're, we're super lucky. Uh, let's get Mike Mahardy in for a second because we're going to talk about Just Cause 3 right before Far Cry Primal. Scott Butterworth, a pleasure as ever. Happy to be here. You've probably got about 12 more games to review. So, uh, Are you reviewing anything right now? Not at the moment, but okay. there are a couple big ones coming out. I don't want to spoil anything, but yeah. Yeah, I got a couple couple of reviews that are going to be uh, the next couple of weeks that will awesome. keep me busy. All right. So. We'll have you back then. Yeah, Thanks so much, excited. Scott. Absolutely. Pre- appreciate it. Mike, Mike Hardy, get your ass in here. Got a sweet cup. Got to swap out cups as well. Yeah. My goodness. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Tag in. Got Steve Brule here. Let's uh, for, yeah. the, for the folks on the video feed. That's got a quote that he Dr. doesn't Brule. say on it. I found it Dr. at a flea market Steve though. Brule, you found this at a flea market. You bought a cup at a flea market. Yeah, the Treasure Island flea market. It's not like a used cup. It's this guy who Jill prints that. pop culture shit on yeah. blocks of wood or ah. cups or so Andy Warhol assorted goods. 
Yes. yes. He's art now. Andy Warhol Jr. <laughs> I always wonder about Treasure Island. For the, Treasure Island is, is the island between the two bridges in the bay. It's radiated as well. It's radiated? It's yeah. Like, do, you, do you not know why? No. Like, no one lives there? I know. It's irradiated? Yeah. There's they, a fucking college campus on it. There's, I know. There's a bunch of things there that people participate in. But yeah, there's like nuclear waste stored underground there. It's like it's not a it's not a joke. It's why that place is so. You barren. were the one that invited me to that flea market. Yeah, well, <laughs> right, I'm not going to drink out of this cup anymore. I, uh, yeah, your fucking irradiated cup. That's well, not as bad actually. In terms of the stories of irradiated nonsense, uh, Werner Goff, who helped us uh, put this, some of the lighting in this room and helped us like put it together, and was very involved in Gamespot uh, live productions of old. He went to a. Oh right. Do you remember? Yeah, I remember hearing about. He it. went to Pripyat for yeah. like a stalker shadow of Chernobyl like press event or whatever and they basically like brought them out to Pripyat and they wore hazmat suits and he fucking kept his he like they were like throw these away and he brought it back on the plane and then he had it in like a foot locker beside his desk at home and he started to get these pains in his knees after oh like five God. months no. uh, and then yeah he brought he brought it into work and somebody uh, Ryan Died. Mack or somebody had like a, had a Geiger counter and they went like oh, really? yeah yeah and oh. it was like totally off the chain boy off the, off the things we had to throw it away thanks Werner there you go we should, get the, we should get it on that cup. Okay, I'll Geiger count this thing, and then I'll see how mad I should be at you <laughs> for bringing me out there. There's other reasons you should be mad at me, but... Oh, I always think if, like a, if a tsunami or something hit San Francisco, Treasure Island would be fucking gone because it's yeah. so flat. And it's now there's nuclear the whole... waste under it, I hear. Yeah. Gonna... <laughs> I'm surprised <laughs> you didn't just... know that. I live in Oakland. That's going to get churned up and brought to my house. <laughs> isn't isn't like half the peninsula already like on landfill? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, yeah, a lot San of Francisco. San Francisco is, yeah. Don't, don't this building. Sand dunes and stuff. Yeah. Detroit. Where I feel like you were just about to mock me then you're like, oh, it's actually, he's right. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't always mock you. I don't always <laughs> joke. Uh, yeah, you always do. Uh, that's why we have you here. Mike Mahardy, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. In the lobby today. First of all, we're going to talk about Far Cry in a little hot second. Cool. But first of all, I'm going to talk to you about Sky Fortresses. <laughs> Oh man! So and, just, uh, fighter just, jet humans. Yeah, just cause three is DLC is coming out. You can turn Rico into an F sixteen or whatever. Yeah, it turns the wingsuit into just it's powered like by bavarium, that substance that you're trying to. Yeah. It's radioactive. Oh really? Substance that you're trying to fight over in uh <laughs> in the base game, and now it just powers your wingsuit, so you have like infinite, not infinite boost, but you could stay in the air for uh, however long you want. You have like a chain gun on one shoulder, missile launcher on the other. You can do strafing runs, and then. Turn on a dime, kind of. He Literally. spreads That's crazy. Yeah. What is it? Is it fun? Yeah, it's really fun. What else do you do in it? Like, what is the DLC? Does it plug There's a Sky into, Fortress up? Does it, does it plug into Just Cause Three proper? Is it yeah. like a separate mission? There's a certain mission that you go to to like upgrade the wingsuit, and then you can just the Sky Fortress is actually floating. You can get to it from wherever. But it's, you can use that. You can, oh wow, here it is. You yeah. you can use this. Uh, say for instance, somebody like me who has only uh, like played. I've only unlocked half the bases in the game. I haven't touched the Big Island yet. If I was to get this DLC, do you think I'd be able to use that suit to take out all those? You would be able to get it soon. Yeah, um, you would probably need a little more, a few more upgrades to actually take on the Sky Fortress because that was like an upper level outpost. Um, I don't know if we'll see gameplay of it, but it'll. It, so the Sky Fortress is divided into two of those outposts. So there's okay. the bow section and the stern, which mm. are both have their own things you need to destroy. And uh, there's like an underbelly to it where a lot of its power cores are that you need to take out. Cool. But and it's also the main enemies are all drones. Right. So there are these drone dispensers. You can get your own one to like kind of fly around, support you, and distract enemies and shoot them. And uh, yeah, the the majority of people I was, or not people, the majority of enemies I was fighting were drones from the Eden Corporation. They didn't tell me too much about the story, so right. I don't know what's going on you with that. You played for like two hours? Did that seem like yeah. about the length of it? No, they said it should take you, it could take you like four with, if you do all the story missions, I guess. Um, mm. I, I was also still getting acclimated to it again, so it was taking me longer than it might if I had been playing Just Cause 3 right before a lot. Yeah. Uh, you know, I played about 20 something hours back when I was reviewing it, but since then I haven't been able to play it too much. So it's kind of rusty. Cool. Uh, it's out in March, Sky yeah. Fortress? Unspecified date in March. And then two months after that will be the land base. It's like air, land, and sea right. DLCs. <laughs> Did you turn into a motorcycle? <laughs> no. You, <laughs> it's like, uh, you. No, it's a mech, actually. It's like Damn. a giant floating mech. Hover That's, mech. Right. And then after that, two months after that, will be the sea one, which is a sea heist. <laughs> yeah, you're a surfboard with a machine Get gun. Get off my back. <laughs> you're just, you ride around a dolphin with chain guns. Perfect. Oh, Wait, I that's that better be true. No, no, no. Damn. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's their call now. They're watching, but uh, no, it's, I, they haven't said too much about it. It's just a sea heist, like on yachts and stuff. Cool. So like oceans, 
11. I just oh, realized okay, the ocean. No, I didn't mean that, I swear. All right. Did Sky for did it seem fun? Like did it Yeah, really yeah. fun. Uh especially if you've played a lot of Just Cause, it might be yeah. the thing to bring you back in cuz I, I, mean, I played like game. 20 hours and I haven't I've only done half the fucking game. Oh yeah. So this like, should be I mean just it makes it even more ridiculous than it already is. So mm. and it's they're making they have no qualms about that. They're just going for it. Excellent. Which I appreciate. Looking forward to seeing more. Thanks so much. Uh yeah. great um Twitch message here from Shapawi says Muppets Treasure Island is the best Treasure Island. Fair enough. That's good. Maybe it's the strong nuclear waste made them into Muppets. That's what Muppets are. It's not quite a mop. <laughs> it's not quite a puppet. No. But man, <laughs> <laughs> Simpsons. No, no, nothing picking up on that. It's uh, I love the Simpsons, but that one flew over my head. That's Pete's thing is to bring up like pop culture references he knows I won't get. That's not true. I just forget how young you are. <laughs> I'm not. You're like. Four years older than me? I'll be 31 in a couple weeks. Well, I'll be 29 in a couple weeks. No, so that's, that's not that's that's not 29. True. You're almost 29? No, no, I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. That's amazing. You've done so many born movies and you're not even 30. <laughs> Ty just said that today. He said he saw The Martian. He's like, yeah, so I was hanging out with my girlfriend and, and Mike. And uh, I was like, oh, I get it. It's a, it's a common thing I hear. Uh, I like it. It's a good comparison. My girlfriend recently told me, uh, she said, I really like your glasses. It stops your face looking like a potato. <laughs> Thanks, babe. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, <laughs> double whammy there as well for the I'll Irish take thing. Matt Damon over mm-hmm. that, I guess. It's bad enough to count my blessings. <laughs> and also, yeah, and also the color on this, the, the camera makes it look like I'm wearing a green shirt as well. I just can't stop it. I'm just a potato. Do potato? Do potatoes <laughs> wear green yeah, they're shirts? Green. They're they also green. grimace and yell with their hands. In yeah, them. yeah, exactly. Okay. They've all got gray hair as well. Okay, cool. Let's talk about video games. Let's talk about video games from the past. Okay, not five years ago. No. You see where I'm going with this? Not ten years ago. How many? Ten thousand years it's a long before time. our Lord and Savior <laughs> Jesus Christ walked the uh, walked the earth. Uh, what initially seemed like a sort of a Blood Dragon style spin off game, uh, it turns out is actually a, a, a really good Far Cry game. Maybe probably the best Far Cry game in a in a little while. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, Mike <laughs> so Mahardy. So committed to your <laughs> evaluation. Maybe probably in a while. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. 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 Just, uh, just sitting <laughs> yeah, on this so. fence. Just woo. Just thought I'd interrupt you real quick there. <laughs> yeah, Far Cry Primal. It's uh, it's out now. It's uh, well, sorry, it's out on consoles. Let's get this out of the way first of all. Have you actually played the PC version yet? I have not. No, I played both Xbox One and PS4, both which perform equally uh, good. Yeah, equally they, well. They both. Well, way the, too many adverbs. Sorry. The PS4 version I played. The Xbox One version I saw everyone playing. Yeah. looks this. It looks the same. They're to both. Me, they both run account. well. Yeah. Yeah. They, like thirty frames a second was the only thing that was making me think. Oh, I'd love to see this on PC. They sure. Had, they never like we got access to the game. I feel like a, a good while ago. It was like late last week. The console. Sorry. Yes, on console. Yeah, yeah. But nothing. But PC still hasn't. I guess it's not out until next week. So. Right. Uh, no, I've not been able to play it yet. But just, I will soon. Yeah. And then we'll update the review. Yeah. To so. Just to make sure it's not. Totally busted. screwed up. Yeah. yeah, which you could go either way. You never yeah. know. Um, but yeah, let's talk about what we have played. Uh, Primal. It's a pretty cool game. Yeah, it's. Uh, it was surprising because I. I think I shared the sentiment with a lot of people that maybe somewhere along the way they would try to make it more. Like they would kind of have to compensate for the fact that you know it's a primitive time and you don't have grenade launchers and rocket launchers. I think mm. I kept expecting. To be like to have some sort of wooden machine gun contraption <laughs> to kind of just <laughs> like ha- like hamstring in the, or that's not the shoestring. Yeah. What is the phrase I'm looking for? Doesn't matter. Doesn't uh, matter. We got it. Yeah. Figure. You know what I'm saying. Uh, I mean, they don't even speak they English in this video game, so don't worry yeah. about it. speaking oh, right. English here. Yeah. That's Look that was one of the great things about this game. They really stick to the setting they establish. It's not. It's I mean, not you, like you, historically sorry, correct. You said for the people watching <laughs> the video. So you know. <laughs> yeah. For the people watching the video version, you literally said that as the B-roll had, uh, I believe, Rob Handry running around on the back of a mountain lion. <laughs> so. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> also, it, you always have a map. <laughs> yeah. And also, you have a map and uh, and you can control owls that drop bee bombs on people. I. The best thing I've done, and I captured <laughs> on my PS4. You know that you know, people always say it's like a running joke about three and four and. Now primals that the eagles are annoying because they'll yes. just swoop on you. An eagle was flying at me as I was stealing. It was a quest to take a, like rare eagle feathers and to craft something specific. And he's flying at me. I took on my club and smoked it. <laughs> he just kept going into the cliff behind me and ragdolled. It was the most satisfying thing ever. I had a, a moment last week when I did the now playing where there was an eagle in the distance picking up a, a goat <laughs> and like flying away around with it. Someone told me this. And I, got, yeah, and this, I missed it with the first one and this, he's like he's about like maybe 40 feet above me in the air and the second arrow fucking nailed the eagle both of them fall down. 
Wait, wait, wait. Oh, you hit the eagle, but the goat yeah. died too. Oh, well, the goat, yeah. Well, the goat, well, like I'm sure he was, both of them. He was, he was alive when the eagle dropped him. Yeah. <laughs> not when he hit the ground. <laughs> uh, uh, before we get into the nitty gritty, I feel like I really, really like this game because I was not expecting to like it. I feel like sure. my expectation, this is like one of those expectation games where they kind of jumped us on it. We didn't know much about it. I think they only announced it in October of last year. Yeah. And then I wasn't really too hot on it. Didn't really know what it was. And then when I started playing, I was like, oh, this is actually like, really interesting and like very different they, in yeah. terms of a first person game. Do you right. think that's, is that any reason why you think you enjoyed it so much? Yeah. I mean, I, th- I remember when they first announced it, I think a lot of us were questioning is, Oh, is this just another blood dragon sized mm. kind of spinoff? And that would have been good. But then they're like, Oh no, it's $60. So then that's when people start getting apprehensive. And after playing it, yeah, it's a f- full game. It, it does not feel just like it, it's a reskin in a few ways, but that's being kind of disingenuous because it, it does a lot of its own things really well. But it's, yeah, I think that factored into how I was really pleasantly surprised at how, like how much it feels very much like its own thing separate from 3 and 4. Mm-hmm. Um, I I think going back, I loved 3, 4, I, I was already getting tired of it. They're such long games. Yeah. Before, I was kind of already having fatigue. So I think if they needed to do something new, this was the time because... Mm. It really is its own thing, and like that was one of the, my favorite parts about the game. Uh, it really sticks to the setting that they chose to go with, and almost, on almost every layer. So it feels like an old Far Cry game, and the fact that this is a game where you're like going out and taking over outposts, and you're mm-hmm. upgrading yourself and your skill yeah. tree, and also, in what ways does it, does it not feel like a Far Cry? In what game does it feel like its own thing? It's very much uh, more focused on survival, not as bad as much as like Don't Starve mm-hmm. or The Long Dark. It's not. Um, that's not its main conceit. It's, but it's, it is a survival enough where you're thinking about it constantly. It's, uh, it's a good balance between trying to survive, but also you're still having fun. It's yeah. not just like dire all the time. Uh, you know, you go into the frozen north and there's a cold meter that kind of keeps uh, falling down. And yeah. if, you're not, if you don't have a torch lit in front of you or you're not near a bonfire, you have to manage because you're, you're just wearing like fur and a <laughs> loincloth, <laughs> yeah. which, you know just put on more clothes you'll be mm. fine but you don't always have <laughs> you can't just put on like raw you can't just leo your way into a horse um, there you go it's a perfect time to give advice as dr brule and yeah <laughs> look to the camera for your health hey kill, kill a horse climb inside you dingus <laughs> i don't know whatever but he that was a bad steve brule impression <laughs> you uh yeah no it's it's really it feels don't worry like no something. one's gonna chop that out yeah. and make a gif out of it <laughs> yeah but it, the, the setting the setting itself is it becomes a detriment at certain points because it's it's true the setting it's primitive it's the stone age your your tool set is limited mm. and it's this is when supposedly you know this is around when humans started making tools mm. or at least a little bit after don't quote me on that don't worry about but it. it's not why people are here yeah but it but the fact that they kind of like stick to those same six weapons and then you get like right. variations yeah. on them it does it feels like it fits really well um, whether it is always fun or not is not. I, I didn't think that was the case, mm. but after a while, I kind of really appreciated how much it really stuck to the Stone Age. Um, we got a bunch of questions from folks here. Obviously, we got to play the game for well over a week, uh, so <laughs> let's jump into it and see if we can answer some of these. Uh, Black Orin Zero on Twitter says, uh, how random are the enemy encounters in this world? Uh, do I need to be always watching my back? Uh, you're kind of tense the whole time, for sure. It's... You know, like especially at night, there's a day night cycle. That's another thing that happens. And oh, the yeah. predators are more aggressive and abundant. And there are different predators at night. There's certain like rare animals you have to hunt at night. But there are, you know, like fire factors into it a lot. So I always want to have a club to light it to make a torch because mm. if there are predators coming up on you from behind, you just swing it. And like especially wolves will freak out with fire. Yeah. Certain animals won't be as affected by it. They'll run away and come back. Like a saber tooth will. You know, consider you and then walk away. Yeah, a bear doesn't give a fuck. It's like the saber tooth. The bear will just be like, <laughs> yeah. "I'm leaving," or no, the saber tooth will be like, "I'm leaving," but it's because I want to, not because right. you're telling me to. <laughs> the bear, yeah, will just be like, "I don't." I can set a bear on fire, and they're like, "He come out the fire." Yeah, yeah, they don't care. And now they're like, "I'm a flaming bear now." Yeah, <laughs> now <laughs> it just, just made me <laughs> way cooler and more dangerous. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. So it, I was pretty constantly watching my back. I know you were saying you were surprised at how like little you were sprinting because you were kind of worried totally. you're just gonna come across a pack of wolves. It's really cool. The wolves 
travel in packs. The tigers hunt alone. It's again, yeah. it's very and at nighttime, all the pumas come out, and it's like, Ugh, yeah, holy shit. Yeah, that was the thing because I, I was wondering how big the map was and what the traversal was going to be like. Because like Far Cry games are, I mean, like one of them had a bloody helicopter you were like flying around in. Mm-hmm. Like there are games about trying to get to the faraway place. Whereas yeah. the moment it was like it, it, it was like it's not about the destination; it's the journey. That's what this one felt like. Where yeah. actually it was interesting going from place to place because you couldn't like just sprint through an area because like I, I was sprinting through areas and I turned and a bear was there and you can't just kill a bear and you can't even outrun a bear you need to like figure out a way of getting away from it and i thought that was incredible because and at the start like it was super scary because literally everything could kill you yeah and then the interesting thing was when you do all the beast master stuff and you train a beast to be your buddy then for instance if you have like a big cat then that scares away all the yeah like wolves and stuff and it, so it's it's one less thing to have to worry about sure uh, which is pretty cool and that's the beast master abilities are probably my favorite part of the game especially mm. when you start doing the uh, legendary beast hunts with a I forget the name of the hunter she like she gives you specific missions to go on to get the blood fang saber tooth the mm. blood tusk mammoth the uh the scar bear or something i got the saber tooth which helped me hunt all the other ones but yeah you eventually i they're kind of the power weapons of far cry primal in like grenade launchers or rocket launchers absence because there were legendary pistols and whatnot but right yeah you you know they become an extension of yourself. You could tell them to go attack a certain uh, enemy, Udom or Azila, the other caveman, mm. um, or uh, just hunt like big mammoths because mammoths take forever to bring down if you're yeah. just using spears. But if you have a, the blood fang saber tooth with you, it's it's pretty cool. It, like when the mammoth close to dying, it's close to dying. The saber tooth will cl- like climb on top and then just bring it down, just destroying it. And then I think Rob said he saw it grab uh, a boar and pull its head back and just like eat its throat. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which I, <laughs> nice. I, I want to see that, but like it. yeah, that's again. And the beast master ability just kind of feed into that setting a little more. I caveman couldn't control animals like that, but it's still a cool way to, yeah. I know I talked to you about this a little bit. I really wish you could make animals hunt for food for you. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Like see your owl, go but get me a squirrel real quick. Not squirrels, but you can have the saber tooth say like, go kill that boar. But yeah, then you but just you, skin it. But they won't like retrieve. You can't be like, All no. right, I'm gonna do this thing. You go get me some food. Yeah, don't worry about it. Just no, it's not <laughs> like a, it's not like a pet companion from what was that Torchlight? Yeah, or yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. fair. Yeah. I don't think the game needs it, but like right. I, that would be so enticing to me. Yeah, it would make because crafting and hunting are such huge parts, and that was it. Does get a little? Here's a tip, actually, a, like a quality of life tip. In the options, you can turn off the. Um, retrieval animation, yes, you so can. you don't have to bend down and wait for him to finish oh skinning the animal. Oh my god, I would have paid and for And now that. you just go up and the, the branch disappears, the animal just becomes <laughs> skin. Yeah, yeah. yeah, actually, yeah, if anyone from Ubisoft <laughs> is listening, actually, I would not pay for that. <laughs> I was about to say Red Dead Redemption, I'd love to have that. There's a great exchange happening in the chat here. Um, uh, Heap Gamer says, I wonder if, can you farm in the game? To which Game Delay replies, uh, a couple of thousand years too early for that, unfortunately. Yeah. Got him. <laughs> so, it is historically accurate. Uh, let's get into a couple of more of the questions you have here, actually, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. Anthony Delio asks, never been into Far Cry, but I like the setting of Primal enough to consider it. Uh, do you think non-Far Cry fans would enjoy this? Yeah, because I think saying something has a Far Cry formula, there's so many different games that kind of use that formula. Even, like, it shares a lot of things with Just Cause 2 and 3. Those are third person and just more destruction, but it's still kind of taking outposts to start covering the map and opening mm. up waypoints. At a certain point, this just becomes its very own thing because it's, you know, it's that survival, it's that kind of primitive time period. Mm. Not that many games have done like, you know, the Stone Age, like And it's a different times. thing to arc as well. It's not like that time. Right, yeah. There's no people, there's no dinosaurs here. Mm. There's no, it's just, it's very, uh, it's simplified almost, and I think it's very much better for it. And I think people who want a Far Cry experience will get that, but also people, who, like the person asking the question, will have a very singular mm. time, like experience with just playing this. Uh, Andy Kelly just asked us saw the question come up about the PC version. Unfortunately, we haven't played it yet, so we can't say uh, speak to that yet. Uh, we've got a question here from our good friend Kevin Van Hord, who says, uh, "Hey Mike, I have a question. Does this game benefit from its caveman language slash subtitles as a creative choice?" So this game, they actually seem to have gone to quite a yeah. large amount of efforts to create pre like proto Latin languages or whatever, like pre human, super early languages. Yeah. Pre human, but pre language. I don't know. Whatever. Fucking languages, linguistics. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> does that work? Like, I've, I felt like the, 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 the really good facial animation they had in Far Cry 3 and 4 was like so much more useful than this because I don't have a fucking clue what these people are saying, but they're like selling it with their emotions. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the same thing here. Um, I don't know that they needed to devote that much time to making their own languages here like i have no idea <laughs> obviously i have no would idea would you have liked the game less or more if they all had cockney language uh, accents um oh, yeah. f- very much more or like russian accents yeah. or 
just as if each tribe had some sort of weird, just like, hey, apart, how? I don't know. What was, what was that? What? That's, his, that's his default. No, that's, that's, the, that's <laughs> the stepbrother's <laughs> sleepwalking. Oh, oh, hi, I'm Carol. Like, there's running around the open world. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think it grounds the setting a little more. And uh, <laughs> it, it serves it creatively as far as the, each tribe has their own language. So, you know, the Udam have this guttural thing. The Azila have a little more uh, of a kind of uh, attractive language, I guess. And then yes. the Winja, you know, like kind of just whinging yeah i don't know that i'd recognize one if i heard it the udam is pretty distinct in like how yeah. guttural it is da, but da, 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 yeah like it's not like orcs. klingons or yeah. orcs yeah you're right or or klingons, you see people yeah. at conventions like using these languages mm -hmm. yeah udam. Udam. It, becomes, it becomes like a major at universities across yeah, the yeah, country Klingon. they'll have weddings in udon that's a thing yeah they'll have udon noodles for the dinner yeah. Yeah. so Perfect. yeah I, I liked it though it, it Help establish the tone a little yeah. more. It feels like a really unique world because, like, even the, the the areas you're in, they're like crazy valleys and like glacial. Yeah, like it just feels like something completely new. Yeah. Uh, Tim Lauro asked a good question, actually, kind of to that point. Uh, from the trailers, it looks pretty brown. Does the open world have much diversity? I think he is talking about environmental and not racial. Sure. Uh, so everything looked like it was very much a, you know, temperate. Yeah. forest like rainforest or something yeah so how much more diversity in terms of the environment is there within that map and how big is the map actually there is uh so the map they're saying the game itself is comparable in size to four the map is definitely not as big as four was huge again because you had helicopters and whatnot yes. but it is uh primal is very much especially given how slowly you traverse the map sometimes not in a tedious way um it you run you come across these area where the forest is just all burned and that right. plays into the story a little bit um however much of a story there is. Um, and then you go into the, the northern part where it's snowy, and then you're, you're in these, like, frozen frozen caves. You go into the swamp, and then that becomes, you know, there are alligators and just, like, mm -hmm. underwater predators everywhere. So not only does it look diverse, but it also kind of feels diverse based on where you are with those kind of different survival aspects. Mm. Uh, great question here as well from Kudge Dave 93 uh, Are there caveman beer drinking games? How much of the like fun little weird caveman stuff is there? And I'm mostly asking this because I want to ask you about the fucking scenes. Oh, the okay, I see what you're saying. I didn't come across as much as Rob did. No. Uh, Rob had some luck or bad luck, however you look at it, coming yeah. across these intimate parts with the. There are, there are multiple yeah. sex things happening between the cave people. Yeah. Like, uh, they're, they're definitely, like, during the main story, there's a few allusions to stuff like that, but I I was not fortunate enough to just stumble <laughs> upon them. I got reached out by one of the uh, developers at Ubisoft Montreal, who apparently had worked on the animations for the sex scenes. Uh, really? And I asked him about the mocap, and he was like, yeah, we did mocap. <laughs> like... <laughs> They were like, it was super uncomfortable for the people doing it. Is that like Shia LaBeouf actually <laughs> had sex for the movie, uh, Nymphomaniac? Oh, did he really? Yeah. Gosh. Like, he actually, they shot them. I'm not surprised. Lars von Trier is a really weird dude. Yeah. I'm, not, yeah. I'm not surprised. Yeah. That's, anyway, we're going a little bit off topic here. Um, yeah, so there you go. Far Cry Primal. Yeah. It's a, good, it's a great game. What's <laughs> up, uh, dude? What's up? What's up? What is that? It's a dumb thing. It's a really good vine if you don't get this. <laughs> so, like, I, every time I see someone else, I'm like, so, dude. And uh, everybody else does it back because, like, it's spread like wildfire. God damn. Wildfire. Uh, that would have worked better for Far Cry 2. Mm. It's a shame. Yeah. You can't set yourself on fire in this one, though. Yeah, you can set yourself on fire. You can set bears <laughs> yeah. on fire. In when fact, I set myself you. on fire all the fucking time <laughs> yeah. in this game. You set a lot of. When you start fighting the Azila tribe, it's all fire. Right. Yeah. And there, there are certain animals that are more resistant to fire. Yeah, your like beast fish. abilities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not alligators. flame fish. <laughs> no, oh shit, or this flame game's not flame fish. Yeah, actually, okay. So when we have our like morning meetings on a Monday and we go through like all the statistics for like how everything did the previous week and how you know what's trafficking and whatnot, one of the things that keeps getting googled is Far Cry dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. uh, are the dinosaurs in this game? No, there is a dragon though. Oh really? It's dead. Um, there's a skeleton of a dragon. It's a blood dragon. Uh, cool. Easter egg. Rob right. and I will check it out during the stream after this. Okay. Yes. Yeah. In fact, we are doing a stream right after this for uh, yeah. Far Cry Primal. So stick around. There's a few, apparently, there's an Assassin's Creed Easter egg, which I have not found myself, but I'm gonna. I might look it up just to see where it is, see it in person. Find the skeleton of that franchise just lying on. The <laughs> <laughs> no Assassin's Creed game this year. Right. Yeah. Probably Watch Dogs, though, right? Hopefully. Watch Dogs too. I think so. Oh yeah. Hopefully. I think so. Watch but yeah, that's too. actually Sa that's what's probably interesting. Set in San Francisco, probably from what I hear. Yeah, the rumor mm -hmm. mill. The rumor mill is that they were around town yeah. last year, so we'll see about that. Stop by uh, CBSI. Say what's up to the GameSpot crew. Yeah, I'm sure they did that when they were doing their secret, super secret. Yeah, looking around San Francisco. Uh, no, I'm saying in the game. Stop by oh, and say what's up right. to us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hang out. You know, hack Peter's computer. See what he's been searching. Yeah, my password is 
butts. I could, I could do <laughs> so, that. Was that two T's could or one? While you were... Well, if I told you, then it wouldn't be a <laughs> That's secret. That's a good point, anymore. yeah. B U T T three. Sorry, what were we gonna say before I rudely interrupted? Uh, yeah, that's why I think Primal is what Ubisoft needed in the short term, because, or I guess long term, because they don't have a new Assassin's Creed this year. As far as the big AAA experience goes, I think yeah. Primal's kind of maybe the shot in the arm they needed to I, kind of keep things fresh. There's also a game called The Division. Yes. Oh yeah. The, oh, and yeah, Wildlands, which is out next month. Sorry, as far as their established franchises go, I should have oh, mentioned. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if it'll sell because part of me is like worried that like all their promotion for this game was like about the Beastmaster and tame the animals yeah. and like hunting, which is like kind of like a, you know, I feel like that would play really well in America maybe with mm-hmm. like certain crowds of like, yeah, okay, like that that type of thing. But like, I wonder how much of a hit they take by not, like it's great that they did this, like all power, you know, to Ubisoft for taking the risk on this and I think they've done a, a pretty good job, but like I wonder how much of a hit they, they take financially when a game doesn't have a gun on the box. Right. No, that's a real consideration. Mm. I'm sure that they, they talked about it. It's, it could be just a chance for them to test the waters with whatever things they've learned from the past few games, helping them at least make it a more efficient development cycle. Right. I don't know, but yeah, maybe wonder, that was part of it. Yeah, I wonder how long they were working on this one as well, considering we only found out about it in October or whatever. Nine months before. Kind of oh, no, sorry. Like, what? How many months was it before it released that we found out about it? Yeah, it was like six or yeah, yeah, seven or eight, really maybe. Short. That's really hard to gauge, though, like yeah. in terms of when the thing started, right? Because sure. Fallout 4 is in development for years. <laughs> right. Yeah. We only got sure. a six months lead time. Yeah. yeah. I like it. Yeah. yeah. Less work for us to do, uh, kind of, but also <laughs> kind of better, less anticipation. Yeah. To yeah. Worry about. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks for coming in. And thanks for answering the me. questions from our good friends in the Twitch chat, GameSpot chat, and via Twitter. And that's a show. That's almost a show. Let's have a quick little chin wag about what we're doing. Mm. Actually, we had you on for Fire Emblem a couple of times uh, over the past weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, those three reviews went up. They did. So yes. people were able to check out the the three. What was it? It was Conquest. Birthright. Birthright. And then the other one that's coming out. Uh, Revelation. Revelation's coming. Uh, some people a bit unhappy about the Conquest, the review of Conquest. They thought that you were yeah. being critical of, of, it, of the... Jerk. Mechanics they'd made, I guess. What were you saying? I said he was a jerk. I was kidding. Oh, he was being a jerk? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can't really talk about this without sounding defensive. So right. I'm going to sound well, defensive I'm asking right now. You. Yeah. Uh, people had problems with my review because uh, my biggest criticism of the game is that they don't let you grind for experience. Yeah. That was the, the, you could in the other two, right? You I mean, can in the other you two. You couldn't in Conquest. <clears throat> and grinding, to me, serves two purposes. One, it helps you, you know, level up your crew so they're stronger. But it also allows you to just sort of explore things in the game that, you know, the, if you just follow the linear story path, you wouldn't really encounter. Mm. Especially something like Fire Emblem where there's like classes and skills and relationships involved. Like there's a lot of things to tap into. Conquest, because it's so linear, doesn't allow you to do those things. Right. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Like people seem to think that I said the game was too hard. Uh, but they were also critical of the fact that I played it with in classic mode with permadeath, right? Where I didn't reset the game, which to me was just mind-boggling. And mm. this was coming from the really passionate Fire Emblem fans, and I don't mean to affront your tastes at all. Like, and I liked Conquest; I gave it a seven. But I felt that by trying to create this really focused experience in a game that is part of a trilogy mm. that sort of shares so many things in common. This one was devoid of so much of the content that makes a modern Fire Emblem game interesting, and this is a modern Fire Emblem game. So they were, were people saying, like to play Devil's Advocate, were people saying that like, oh, this is sort of harkening back to Fire Emblems of old, and yeah, and it, it does yeah. seem like a mechanic that would constrain, would like, I don't know, like control the difficulty a little bit. Totally, yeah. and I made it two thirds of the way through the game on uh, classic difficulty without resetting to save any revived characters mm. before I got to the point where I was like. I'm playing the same mission over and over. I can't get through it. If only I could grind. All I can do is turn the game down to ca- to casual right, and to yeah. easy mode. Uh, and so that was another thing. I felt like I was penalized for sticking with the the permadeath aspect. Um, and again, people were telling me that, oh, you have to play it like a strategy game, Pete. Hmm. It's like, oh, thank you for telling me. I didn't realize this was a strategy <laughs> game. Like, I think, you know, I, I was pretty diligent the whole time. It was tough. But more than that, like I just I wanted the opportunity to develop more relationships and develop my team. And where some people said, well, maybe that would make the game too easy. Mm. My answer to that is, well, the enemies can scale with you. That's an option. Right. Uh, so you know, anyway, like I still think Conquest was great, and I'm yeah, and I'm, seven out of ten, right? Yeah, and, and I apologize if my review wasn't clear enough. But like, but really, I think people should consider the fact that as much as this is trying to be a classic Fire Emblem game, it, it's coming out like along two really modern games, and. Again, they, they share things that just 
aren't really as accessible in this one. It's a super interesting way to release games. I think like I, I wish I was a fan of that series. Like I'd yeah. love for one of my favorite franchises to release like three different ideas, like three different yeah. flavors of the same game. It's but super interesting. It's interesting, but I think you can accomplish the same thing by providing alternate narrative paths or mm. options in the game, you know, like turn off grinding, turn off anything you want. The Fire Emblem lets you customize so many things. Right. At this point, it's sort of like, and the fact that they're forcing this this harder version out as its own version is is kind of just an excuse to have more products. I, mm. I mean, aren't they doing some DLC as well down the line? That's gonna there's like a bunch of DLC. There's a bunch of DLC, but you have to pay for it. Right. So if I'm paying for the privilege of grinding to earn experience in one game, when I get it in the box with the other game, wait, are they actually going to apply grinding to Conquest? Yeah, you buy things called experience missions. Oh, you can, oh really? Yes. Okay, that's, they're available in all wait, the what? all the versions of the game. Yeah. Oh, okay. But is that a bit weird? <laughs> it's not a bit like, hey, here's that thing you might have wanted. It Sorry, I didn't realize yeah, that this no, no, was no. a yeah. Ugh, yeah, it, it's it's a weird it's a weird scenario. Right. Um, I think look, I applaud Nintendo for taking you know the the chance to do something like this. But again, you know, you order the special edition of the game if you were lucky enough to be one of those people to get in right yeah. when it was announced. You get all three games on one cart. Yeah. So it was possible. They chose not to do it. And, you know, for anyone who buys Conquest not knowing what they're getting into, right. they might find themselves, you know, with a little bit of buyer's remorse. Mm. And then their only alternative is to return the game for less than they bought it for or purchase the other version, yeah. you know, as DLC. And, and, and that's too bad when I think, you know, the special edition proves that they can all fit on one cart and everyone can have everything if they really wanted to. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you so much. That's probably the last time we'll get you to talk about Fire Emblem on the show <laughs> for another little while. Actually, until the next one's out. Until... Oh, I guess you've already covered the review. Of we've it. covered, yeah, we've yeah, covered that so. review. Yeah, no, but I mean, Fire Emblem's awesome. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, I just it's want awesome. more of it. God, there's been so many good games coming out this year already. It's like we're not even GDC time. It's mid February, and we've already had like bunches of great games coming out. This used to be the dead zone. This used to be like nothing comes out in January and then stuff kind of warms up around February. People got money in their wallets again, but bunches of great stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I got so much more Far Cry Primal to play as well. Yeah. At this stage, uh, what are you working on at the moment, Mike? Before we wrap it up, um, playing like Dark Souls soon, just for like a thing before release. Yeah. Check it out one more time. Uh, other than that, just real soon. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> other than that, I'll probably play more Primal. Uh, Zelda Twilight Princess. I'm a huge Zelda yeah. fan, mm. uh, so I'm really looking forward to uh, playing more of that. I got to uh, the the first dungeon, past those two hours, which are pretty tough to uh, mm. to stomach, especially yeah. in like in retrospect. Remember, uh, I always knew they were kind of cloying, but playing it again is tough. Yeah. But it looks really good, and uh, it's like you, I was playing on the the gamepad for a while, but now I'm playing on the pro controller. It just feels a little better. Sweet. Yeah, and then uh, other than that, just. Rocket League, oh. while I listen to Taylor Swift. Oh, uh, <laughs> having a barbecue party this weekend. You should stop by. I just moved out to the new place. Oh, yeah, yeah. congratulations. Nice yeah. work. Thank you so much. Everyone. You moved in in, in like a GameSpot pad. Yeah, there's like a few of us. the office works there or lives there's there. There's a few of us, yeah. yeah. And probably works there. Yeah. We're all yeah I'm getting some work done. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Nice work. Come by. You say Rocket League. Yep. And I've already got a, like, my stomach's already starting yeah. to turn because we've got the finals on today. Of yeah, our, I'm, that's right. I'm, I'm missing our, it, unfortunately, yeah. but I'll go back and watch it in the archive, I'm sure. Yeah, the Pro-Am, which we've been running, if you didn't know, we've been running on uh, GameSpot for the past, I don't know, for, for like two months, I feel like Josh has been knocking this thing together. Nearly. It's basically yeah, like so. uh, people who play Rocket League and people who don't play Rocket League, kind of buddy yeah. up 2v2 style. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, Chris Pereira, Matt Paget uh, against Eric Tay and Ryan Schubert yeah. in the loser's bracket final. And then whoever wins that plays myself and Julio in yeah. a 5v5 in the grand final. Oh, sorry, a, a five round, best of five, yeah. 2v2. I'm so nervous because I've been playing so <laughs> bad all weekend. Pete and I would really? probably be yeah. at this point if we didn't both dive, take a dive for money. It has nothing <laughs> to do with skill. So, sure. Completely in our power to keep winning, but we just decided against it. Yeah. I'm hoping Josh like throws a curveball and we end up playing on like that donut level or something. That'd be great. Just like completely Those fun. ones are fun. Not my I like preferred, the, but they're fun. I like that they're there. Yeah. It's like when you get Unreal Tournament, you just you you don't you don't do level lord missions in like competitive play, but yeah, let's all fucking shoot each other in a massive kitchen. <laughs> yeah, just for a couple of minutes, fun, right? Here's the Simpsons house. Great. It's a nice break from reality. Yeah, stop taking it so seriously. Video games, come on. Uh, thank you both for coming on. Mike Mahardy, Peter Brown, Scott Butterworth, who uh, who has uh, left us. He's off doing other things. And thank you so much to everyone who's been reviewing uh, the lobby on iTunes and all of your i things, all of your podcast machine 
do hickeys. <laughs> See, it's not even that like I'm not in tune with podcasting. It's a podcast. I can't believe podcasting is still around. Yeah. Well, I, but you know what though? Like audio is so convenient. You can listen to it while you're doing mm. almost anything else. I know. I listen to like more podcasts now than I have in my entire life. Yeah. But for a while there, it looked like, oh, it was like came and gone. Yeah. But no, that's the beauty of them. Yeah. And so many people are listening to this show. So thank you so much. I know it took us a while to do it. Uh, thanks to all the folks. Uh, Jeff and Mr. Barrier and Ohio Designer 9 and Kakarsk and <laughs> Bry210. I love it. Even on iTunes. People, which is like something you tend to have, like, you know, you spend money on that. Yeah. They still got ridiculous names on that as well. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I appreciate it. If you're listening to the show, if you're uh, watching it at all uh, and you're on iTunes, feel free to rate and review us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. That's the show for this week. We'll be back next Tuesday. Thank you again to everyone in the back for producing this show. Andy Bowman behind that steady cam. Give us a little bit of wobble. Give us a little bit of wobble. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Shake those hips, motherfucker. Uh, Josh Shaw on the back. And uh, Mary Kish back there as well. Everyone putting this show together. Really appreciate it. We will be back Tuesday, 2 p.m. Pacific. Sorry, Eric Tay. I forgot about you there. And Richard as well. I forgot everyone. Mm. A lot of people are in this show. Uh, we'll be back Tuesday, 2 p.m. Pacific. Eric's hovering that finger over the close button. Let's see if you'll get it right. We'll see you then. Boss, stick around. Far Cry Primal Stream right after this. <laughs> <laughs>